This is a championship fight. This is MMA Fight Corner on Fox Sports Radio and all over the world from the mecca of mixed martial arts, Las Vegas on UFCRadio.com. Here are your hosts, Heidi Fang, Phil Devine, and Joey Varner. Hey, this is Mike Colbert, going to the Ultimate Fighting Championship, and you are listening to the MMA Fight Corner. Here we go! Here we go! All right, welcome to the MMA Fight Corner, coming at you from the Fox Sports 920 studios in Las Vegas and broadcasting worldwide on UFCRadio.com. For your hosts, Heidi Fang, Joey Varner, and Phil Devine, I am your referee for today's action, Dave Carney. We have got a great big show for you today on the MMA Fight Corner. The crew is going to be breaking down all of the UFC on Fox 7 card. This was a great fight card this weekend, guys. Without further ado, we're going to jump right into the Fox 7 recap coming up a little bit later on in the program. We're going to be waiting for an interview that Heidi set up with UFC women's bantamweight fighter Sarah McMahon. And then, of course, later on in the show, this week in MMA history with Phil Devine. Crew, let's start it off. Heidi, break us down a little bit here on the Fox 7 fight card. What a great show this was this weekend. Start us off. It was totally fantastic. Although the main event, Benson Henderson versus Gilbert Melendez, a lot of people are saying the split decision should have gone another way. I don't see it that way. I see it actually that it was in uh, Henderson's favor in the end. But, you know, I, I really watched round two again closely yesterday, and that could have been the one that went either way. So yeah. I think it's fair enough to say that it was for Vincent. But originally, I had rounds one, two, and five for Melendez. You know, it's funny, though. It's because I, I, when I watched it, I thought round two of all the rounds was, was clearly was the most dominant round for Benson. I, I gave... Uh, I gave Benson round two. Gilbert had round one, obviously. Clearly. But, but round two, I thought Benson really took control of that, stole the, stole the edge from him. And I thought in three and four, Benson's output really went up, and Gilbert's output went down. He slowed down visibly. He slowed down by the numbers. If you look at his punch and kick, it, it, and his whole output for those those two rounds, he did less in those two rounds in the, in, in, than he did in rounds one or five. But uh, I, I definitely gave – and I, I was pulling for Gilbert because I picked him, you know, uh, which was a rare thing because bef- the show before that I obviously – was going with Gilbert when I went back and studied. You know, I thought Gilbert could do it, um, <clears throat> but uh, I gave two, three, and four to Ben. I thought he did it convincingly. Uh, I think it was such a razor close fight. It could have gone either way. Um, you know, I wasn't surprised when I heard split decision. I did score for Gilbert, but like I said, it, it was so razor close. I think the only clear round that I had for Gilbert was one. Uh, three, maybe two was definitely for Benson, and four or five. You know, it was a toss up. But um, still, it was a great fight that capped off an amazing, just an amazing fight card in general. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, in hindsight, it came out that one of the referees, the only referee to score it for, for, ben, uh, for Gilbert Melendez, runs a gym that's a Caesar Gracie gym. He's part of the Caesar Gracie team, Caesar Gracie family. He owns a Caesar Gracie gym. Uh, is there a conflict of interest there? Do you think that this guy should have been allowed to even be a referee or a judge I- in a fight that, that has a fighter from his his gym, in essence? Well, we've talked about it before in the past where we've said that, you know, when you have a former fighter that is a referee, I mean, as a judge, that usually they will kind of side with what they know, you know. Whether it's conscious or, or subconscious. Exactly, or exactly. Right. If you have a guy who's a black belt in jiu-jitsu, like you know, scoring, he, he may look at, like you said, the Tim Means fight where you have a guy who's doing so much def- so much work from the bottom, you know, but another person might think that, you know, that's not enough output. So, you know, it definitely is subconsciously or consciously, it, it, you're going to have weigh it. On your decision. it. It does weigh on your decision. I think it's one of those gray areas. Should it be going on? Mm, probably uh, not. Probably yeah. not, but can we stop it? I don't think so. I don't think there's anything you can do about it right now. I'm curious to know, like, how they actually get appointed to become a judge because if they have no control over which fights that they're placed on, then how do you avoid that issue? Well, you're supposed to. When you, when you fill out the athletic commission the, uh, paperwork, whether you're going to be a corner or a fighter or a judge or referee, they ask you if you have any interest in a gym, in a gym that's, you know, okay. any interest in the fighter, any, int- any interest in, the, in a gym, you know, they kind of have this vetting process where all these questions 
you know, should make it's it like clear jury whether, duty. Okay. whether you have a teammate. Or, yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, and real quick, speaking of guys in the corner, we were lucky enough to have a guy that was on TV almost as much as the fighters this weekend. Stitch Duran last week uh, was was great on the MMA fight corner, and he did some fantastic work he, uh, keeping these guys in excellent shape uh, throughout the evening. I mean, you, real quick, tell me about how much a corner guy uh, like Stitch can really help out your performance, Joey. Well, di didn't we say we would nickname this one Blood? There was so much yeah, of right. it. Stitch yes. was really needed. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and that's going to make or break a fight. You know, you get split open and the blood's coming out and, you know, Right away, the doctors are their their eyes get wide. You know, they're like, "This is my chance to do my job." You know, doctors are they're stop happy. You know, and, and of course they're looking out for the best interest of the fighters. But you know, it, that cut opens, and, and and they're not looking for reasons to keep the fight going. They're looking for a reason to stop the fight. Well, and that's going to segue us into a fight I want to set you guys up for next. One of the bloodier fights of the card, which was a, just a fantastic fight. But Nate Diaz, okay, versus our man Mr. Thompson, the Punk, right? Take us through this fight, guys. Joey, we'll start with you on this one. What did you see? Because this turned into a bloody fight. What did you see about this fight? What did you like? You know what? I loved I loved uh, Josh Thompson's game plan. He he lured, you know, he let Nate Diaz pressure him, but he was using his footwork. He was using his footwork, and he was chopping away at those leg kicks. And what he was doing when he was chopping away at those leg kicks, he was setting up that look low, go high head kick. And he landed that three different times. The third time was, of course, you know, the one that, the one that started the end. You know, that mm -hmm. was the icing on the cake. But, um, you know, he did a great job. And we've never seen Nate Diaz get knocked out before. Uh -huh. You know, we saw him. He took a Benson Henderson shin bone to the dome uh, in the previous fight, and he was fine. He had all his senses about him. You know, he was his clear-eyed and still pressing forward. But that third kick that Josh Thompson landed, man, that put him on Bambi legs, and Josh just went in for the kill. It was awesome. When was the last time we saw a towel get thrown in? I, it was GSP. Uh, What's up with that, though? What's up with that, honestly? <laughs> the hardcore gangsters, like, you got to kill, you know, uh, you know, I'm tough, I'm going to fight. He wasn't even getting, I mean, the referee was going to stop it, but of beatings and, and you know, I, I could see a towel getting thrown in if he was bispinged. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, uh, unconscious, head bouncing, and the referee missed it. Like if it was a Kim Wenslow refereeing job mm -hmm. where the guy was just getting his, his unconscious cam his head, un you know, unconscious head getting bounced off the canvas from punches and elbows, and the referee just couldn't see it. I could see that, but he, was fu he wasn't even unconscious. He was just, you know, he was rocked, and he was just kind of turtled up. But he... You, what, what up? You guys are supposed to be the, the 209 gangster squad and you're throwing the towel? <laughs> well, what, what's up with that? It might come down to being family. Yeah, like was it Nick? Brother. Nick was in his corner, you know, obviously. So it, you don't want to see your brother take that kind of a beating is my assumption. But, you know, maybe you just thought he had enough and you've trained with him your entire life. So you know when enough is enough for him. Well, yeah, well, I'm well, just well. Saying, you know what? You know what? You want to know what gangster is? Gangster is, uh, rest in peace, Diego Chico Corrales fighting, fighting Floyd Mayweather. Been knocked down six, seven times in the fight. He just gets dropped again. He's behind on every single scorecard. He's getting dominated. His corner, which I believe at the time was, was his father-in-law. I could be mistaken, though. Throws in the towel, right? And he loses it. He gets up. He goes like, what the hell are you doing? I was going to win that fight. I was going to stop him. That's, that, you know, had Nate Diaz done that, I'd have been like, damn, that is gangster. Well, and, and see, that was the thing. He was taking a lot of punishment. And let's talk about something else, though, real quick that's not gangster as well. We're going to go back to the first fight that we, we were talking about here, the Benson Henderson uh, versus the um, Melendez fight. But at the end of this fight, and Joey, you said this was something that they had to know was going to happen. Uh, Heidi, why don't you tell us, though, what you thought about the proposal in the ring. We're going to take this from our female's perspective first. So <laughs> Benson Henderson proposes to his girlfriend after he wins the title, okay, in a, in a non-convincing fashion. So, again, I'm not for this whole thing, but you tell me what you Wait, think first. we got to preface this, though, because <laughs> Heidi isn't your typical girl. You're going to get a female that. perspective. Oh, but listen, you know she's, I mean? she's still you more, might, you more woman a, than any of you us. You might get a better female <laughs> perspective if you go to Phil over okay. here. Now, that's a low blow. No <laughs> doubt. Phil, Phil, you're going to have to come back with that in the second segment, so we're going to be waiting for a response back to Joe, St uh, Joe Stradamus here. But Heidi, tell us what you thought about the proposal and, and kind of how you saw that go down. It was cheesy, in my opinion. Don't do it there. Do it like in a nice restaurant with some flowers and all that. And I get it. You won your championship fight. 
you're on top of the world. But think about for her, she's walking in onto a canvas filled with blood and sweat and stuff, and she has to like say yes in front of a booing crowd that is just not happy that Vincent won that decision. And then that's kind of a bad omen if you're going to start a, a whole marriage process that way. Let me ask you this. Do you think, because he probably let it be known, Benson, to the promotion, yeah, you know, I'm planning on proposing yeah. soon. Do you think the UFC put him up to that? So why don't you do it on TV? No. Do you think that was coaxed or anything? No, I think I, I think Benson Henderson is cheesy enough to do that. Uh, in the press conference, also, he said he actually wasn't sure if he was going to do it had he lost, or you know, had it the fight not maybe not gone the route that he thought it would. He had said in the, the press conference a couple times that he wasn't sure that he was actually going to do it. So okay, it was well a last minute. Decision. Well, listen, she up. had to know it was going to be done. He had to know he was doing it because she was allowed to come in the cage. Right. She didn't have a credential on. All his corner men, you're allowed to have a certain amount of corner men in your corner. And of those corner men, I think in a championship fight, only two or three are allowed three, three are allowed three. in the cage after your fight. The other two have to wait on the outside. So they came in, right, and then they brought her in. So she was an unaccredited, uncredentialed person. When he had the allotted, so they had to, that had to be pre orchestrated in order for her to be even allowed in the cage, in order for the athletic commission to even let her in the cage. Okay, so let me throw this to you guys. And Phil, I'll start with you on this one because it's going to segue us into a next uh, topic here. And we still got a lot to break down on this Fox 7 card. We're going to go over this whole thing during the show. We've got the Matt Brown uh, Jordan main fight coming up. But uh, Phil, I'll start with you and, and talking specifically about the UFC and what they'll do for promotion. So we were talking a bit off air. Dana White is announcing that the winner of the, uh, the uh, Maynard and Grant uh, fight will get a title shot. Now, you and Joey and Heidi all know that Dana will do a lot of different things for promotion. So do you, A, think it's outside the realm of possibility what Joey said, that maybe this was set up, or B, that this is just kind of something that he allows to happen in order to, to create more hype? No, I think it was, uh, it, I don't think it was set up by the UFC. I think that was Benson's plan, and he probably brought it to Dana, and Dana was completely fine with it. It would look great on a Fox card. It shows that these people are human, and they are, you know, not, you'll go in there and you'll see these guys beat the living hell out of each other, but he's still a loving, you know, partner to, it, to somebody. But my friend texted me during the fight, or after the fight, and he was like, I don't get it. And he's married, let me tell you this. <laughs> he's like, I don't get it. He just won that fight. But then immediately committed suicide. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I got a question for you, Phil. Uh, you were saying that it shows that these people are really the f fighters are human. Wait, say that. Again. What's the word? The fighters are human. Like human. Human. Huh? Human. It's it's also is that one like of is that a person that's from Yuma, Yuma Arizona? Yeah, and, 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 Yuma? We, and we know the Yuma Bales bondsman. He is from Arizona. Yeah, yeah. Ben Henderson is from Arizona. It's New York. Yeah. New York. You know, I'm gonna. Hey, look, I I am I throw Phil out of the bus consistently. It's okay because you do it on the air. I'm gonna do it in the street. Oh, I will throw you oh, under oh, a bus. Oh boy. <laughs> well, listen, if there's any uh, professional uh, legal folks that are listening to our show, this won't go down like that. We do promise you. It was a joke. Uh, you was know, a and we actually have some that uh, do great work for us. All right, guys, uh, we're going to take a short break. When we come back here on the MMA Fight Corner, we're going to talk a lot more about the UFC on Fox 7. We've got a lot of fights to cover. We're also going to be talking about Team Alpha Male's success really sweeping through the night, a hat trick. Also, eight KOs. This was the most by any fight card since UFC 92. So we've got that and a whole lot more coming right up here on the MMA Fight Corner. You're listening on Fox 920 in Las Vegas and worldwide on UFCradio.com.
And now back to the MMA Fight Corner. Fight Corner. Live from the Fox Sports 920 studio in Las Vegas. And streaming worldwide on UFCRadio.com. All right, welcome back to the MMA Fight Corner here on Fox 920 in Las Vegas and worldwide on UFCRadio.com. If you're just tuning in to the MMA Fight Corner, we are recapping the UFC on Fox 7 card that just went down this weekend. Great, great stuff. We're going to start off this segment by uh, talking more about some of these incredible fights. Phil, we're going to start off with the Mir Cormier fight. This was a really, really hyped fight. You guys were talking about this a ton over the last week and a half, two weeks. I think you know both of these fighters pretty in intimately because of their experience in the UFC and, and around in MMA world. So why don't you break down the fight a little bit for us, and then we'll go around the horn with Joey and Heidi as well. I don't know. I, I'm Joey, when you, we walked in, you were talking about that fight, and I think it went down pretty much like exactly like we thought it would. Uh, and it's interesting because during uh, the post-fight interview, Daniel Cormier said that he really uh, wanted to use his wrestling during camp, and he wasn't happy with his training camp because they didn't want him to use his wrestling. Um, I think he did that, and I think he, he used it very well, and he did exactly what we thought he would do. I have to say, you know, even though in loss, I'm impressed with Frank Mir. You know, we talked about it the other day. He's never lost a decision, okay? He's, he's won a few, but he's never lost a decision, and that usually meant that when he was late into a fight or went to the judges' scorecards, he was dominating the fight. All right, just couldn't put the guy away. But when he loses, you know, with law, it was because he gave up. Yeah, right? yeah. You know, it was one of those things like he gave up because it wouldn't even go to the decision. If he was losing, he gave up. He, he saw that, lo that lost will. I didn't see that this time, and I saw his cardio looked better. It wasn't fantastic. But it looked better than usual. No, you know what? Uh, I, I agree and disagree because, uh, you know, it's not always that he gave up previously when Frank Mir was stopped. They have the saying, fatigue makes cowards of us all. Yes. And when he hit that second, third round and he was gassed out and the guy was turning it up, he just didn't have the juice to fight them and that kind of broke his will. But in this fight, I thought his cardio really looked fantastic. He came out in that third round fresher than I've seen him a lot of times in the end of a first round. Yep. You know, he was on his toes. He was lifting Cormier up with body kicks. Those were vicious body kicks. And Cormier didn't have an answer for those right away. You know, he kind of backpedaled and ran away from them. So Frank Mir in defeat definitely looked great to me. You can see the work he put in at Greg Jackson paid off. He didn't get the win, but you can see he, he was a new fighter. He was fresh later in the round. And uh, people, you know, he's still in the division. He's still he's still a threat. He's, he still looked revitalized and reinvented. And I can see him posing damage uh, uh, to other fighters, but with Daniel Cormier, we talked about his wrestling being the difference maker in this fight, but the thing we didn't talk about, it was the wrestling versus the jiu-jitsu, him taking Frank down and controlling the top position, but we didn't talk about is the fact that he could use his wrestling to control him up against the cage, and just almost like a Randy Couture style fight, you know, mm -hmm. he, it was a dirty boxing clinch game against the fence, and he really utilized what we don't see is like almost a standing front headlock, head and arm, you know, standing, and he used that to set up you know his knee attack to the body and he also would open up with some vicious uppercuts body hooks you know step upstairs land two or three the piece to the head and then come back in and get that front headlock so impressive performance you know he said he was let down Daniel Cormier did by his performance he said he felt like he laid an egg but I thought he did great well and you know I was just going to say before we uh, take Heidi's uh, spin on this as well I thought this was the most impressive part about the post fight uh, conference is that Cormier said he wasn't happy with his performance that he thought that he had a lot to learn from this this was a unanimous decision. Everybody had this fight scored at 30-27. Uh, so this is a unanimous decision when the guy remains undefeated. He's 12-0 and right now, and yet he's not happy with, with his performance. So, Heidi, let me ask you, with, with a fighter's mentality like that, how high do you think his ceiling is in oh, the UFC? He's, he's a former Olympian. He, his ceiling is very high. I mean, he comes in there, and he's already ranked top three in the UFC. And you know, you want to be, I guess, able to finish a fight. You want to have that devastating impact where you feel like you completely dominated. And maybe for him, being up against the cage, because it's a place where he's not been comfortable in the past, the, it was just awkward for him trying to do that. Plus, he had, you know, you add in the UFC nerves, 
and he said he did have a case of them before the fight you know and he said that his legs just didn't feel normal when he was in there his stomach was going and he said he didn't think that was going to happen being on all the levels that he has been in the past but it did and it's uh, the octagon jitters right we've talked about that a lot on the show i was going to say last week you guys were talking about that a lot and, and phil you and joey were talking about how a lot of these fighters come from you know different divisions strike force wec they they meet a lot of the same competition a lot of the same guys that they're fighting but there's something about the bright lights of the ufc cameras the you know being in the official octagon so from a fighter's perspective, Joey, we'll ask you, from a fighter's perspective, how much do you think that really impacts a guy like Cormier, who's been in the Olympics, who's you know had a lot of success already? Uh, do you think that, that amplifies his skill set a little bit, or do you think that, like you know Heidi was saying, can give you a little too much jitters? Oh, no, it definitely can be a negative factor, you know, um, because if you're used to performing in a certain way and you feel a certain way when you perform, you feel comfortable under the spotlight, you've gotten used to that, and suddenly you step out and you don't feel comfortable. You know, you don't feel like you usually do when you're in those same circumstances. Your body is not flowing or working like it usually does. So what's that do? Is that gets the mind going. What's going on? Why am I feeling this way? Okay, relax, you know. And you're having this inner dialogue with yourself where you're conversing about what's going on with your body, the nerves, the way your legs feel, you know, instead of tuning that out, breathing, focusing, and flowing with your fight like you're supposed to be doing. So it can definitely impact your performance. And Cormier even said that. You know, he felt it did impact his performance. He, you know, Heidi, you touched on it. He said before the fight, people asked him if he thought the Octagon Jitters were real. He said, you know, for some people maybe, but for me, no. I've been in the Olympics. I've competed at this level. I've been doing this my whole life. I'm comfortable in the spotlight. And then he said he gets there, and his legs don't work. Yep. He's, he's got bubble guts, you know. He's right. just... Uh, <laughs> It's, it's, it hit him. Well, and it's like you and Phil were talking about last week, Joey, um, the fact that having a really common corner presence really is there for those reasons because guys do get these octagon jitters and you can't have a scream or a yeller in the corner because, like you were saying, from a fighter's standpoint, that will just worsen your heart rate, right? So that, that does the negative thing. But, if, you know, right now, real quick, I want to transfer uh, us into one of the next great fights of the night. And, again, Heidi, we're going to start off with you. This is the Matt Brown versus the Jordan Meehan fight. What a fantastic fight. Can't wait to hear what you all thought about that. But we'll start off with you here, Heidi. Uh, what was your take on it? I loved every second of this fight. I think I watched it a total of three times this weekend. Wow. Okay. <laughs> you did like that oh, fight. Oh, yeah. I mean, Matt Brown, the resurgence that he's had, going to a five-fight win streak, uh, Mian coming in as the next hottest thing, the next top prospect for the UFC at, the, at this weight class. And what did he do in the first round? He did come into Matt Brown's fight. He let Matt Brown dominate. And it was a prototypical Matt Brown in-your-face brawl from what I, my perspective was of it. Uh, he makes every cage his home, and he does what he does best. He dominates. He brings it in, his style, heavy pressure striking. Um, for me, and I mean, he was trying to answer the best he could. And for the fact of the matter... Uh, I think towards the end when uh, Matt Brown had the post-fight interview, he said that there was one point where he was almost incapacitated because Jordan Meehan was landing those heavy body shots on him. He had him down. He had him in the turtle position. He just couldn't finish him there. You, you saw the pain. Oh, yeah. You saw the pain that he was in with those body shots. And, you know, right from the start of the fight, you know, it's fight starts and Mean comes out and throws a standing elbow. And... Right from that point on, it, it just, I, I kept having that song in my head, anything you can do, I can do better. You know, back, oh, anything, anything mean through, Brown was right back there throwing just as much. And then the end of the fight, though, was so brutal with, with you know, it was just like a big brother job. We had talked about Jordan Mean, would he be the guy, you know, he beat Dan Miller, was the first person to ever stop Dan Miller. Matt Brown had never been knocked out. Would he be the guy to knock out Brown? I don't, it was a fantastic fight, and it was just violence personified. You know what kind of blew my mind with the fight is, you know, Matt Brown, he's been a pressure fighter in the past, but he's not consistently a pressure fighter, and he hasn't been fast, you know. If you look at the Swick fight, you know, uh, uh, Quick Swick was quicker. He was longer. He was slipping longer punches at Matt Brown. He was he was just that much quicker than Brown. Um, Brown was a lot slower than, 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 than Mike Swick. Now, he eventually caught him and put him out with that right hand, but of the two, Swick was much quicker with his punches. He was long, bop, bop. You know, they were long and lengthy. Very similar build, very similar quickness to Jordan Meehan. So I, I thought coming in, you know, I, we've been a big fan of Jordan Meehan's for, for a long time mm -hmm. since the Strike Force days, you know, and, and I thought he was going to be similar to have the similar effectiveness as Mike Swick with that length and the quickness advantage. I thought he's going to be a lot quicker. But boy, man, Matt Brown just hopped on him, was on his face, and he mauled him, you know? Yeah. I mean, he ate a lot of body shots and he got dropped and, and was in pain. But uh, it's funny because, you know, 
body shots are worse than headshots. You get hit with the body shot, and the thing is, they say you get hit with the headshot, and, and, and it might affect your legs a little bit, but your legs, they get back, and you recover, and you start moving forward. But body shots, you're not supposed to recover from. They're supposed to be accumulative. The more you take, the more it wears on you. The more it breaks you down, the less you can do. So the fact that Matt Brown took the body shots that he took and was able to come back, was able to come back faster, stronger, and apply that level of pressure, that's impressive. Absolutely impressive. And Matt Brown on a five fight win streak right now what a resurgence Heidi you mentioned it before and you saw how excited he was after ran over picked Joe Silva up gave him a big hug Matt Brown is a force to be reckoned with in the welterweight division and just w the improvements that this guy's making you know you look at this guy's record and he's what 17 and 12 17 and 11 yeah. you know you look at that and you don't think champion right away but you know there's a possibility in the future one day for this guy. Okay, let me ask you, what's next? I mean, some names that are popping in my head, you know, they usually, in the UFC, they usually do win, win, loss, loss. So if you won, you're going to fight a guy that won. If you lost, you're going to fight a guy coming off a loss. Um, you know, one guy that I was thinking about ahead of time was Nate Marcorp, but Nate, Nate just came off a loss, so that's not going to happen. But um, I'd love to see a, a, a maybe a Jake Ellen. No, he's fighting. Who's. Jake Ellenberger, He's fighting Rory. D D Rory McDonald, right, he does have a fight book, uh, but you know what? Yeah. Oh, the winner of that fight, those I, two are the ones I was actually thinking was Jake and Roy versus Maya. I'd like to see him against the top ten guy, no exactly. doubt about it. So Maya still hasn't booked a fight. I want to see Maya and Nick, Nick Diaz. Diaz yeah. Yeah. Nick Diaz, yeah, Nick Diaz will take it. That's all up, you know. And I, I, you know what? The Maya Brown fight doesn't excite me as much, especially with the style that 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 Maya has been fighting lately, because I think he just swarms out there and mauls him and hugs him and makes it, you know. I think he could do to, I think Damian Maya has the skill set and the ability to do to Matt Brown what he did to Rick Stone. What he yeah. did to John, John Fitch, Fitch, you know, and just just blanket him, jujitsu blanket, you know, and so uh, I want to see Matt Brown tested with the top ten fighter, but I want to see him someone that's going to be a, that you know bring out the best Matt Brown like Jordan Meehan did. All right, well, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break here on the MMA Fight Corner. You're listening on Fox 920 in Las Vegas and worldwide on UFCradio.com. When we come back, fellas, we have got on the line with us UFC's bantamweight Sarah McMahon, who's going to be fighting in the UFC 159 card against Sheila Gaff coming up here this April 27th. You are not going to want to go anywhere. You're listening to the MMA Fight Corner here on UFCradio.com and Fox 920 in Las Vegas. MMA Fight Quarter. Fight Quarter. Live 
from the Fox Sports 920 studio in Las Vegas and streaming worldwide on UFCRadio.com. All right, welcome back to the MMA Fight Corner here on UFCRadio.com and Fox 920 in Las Vegas. Guys, as we alluded to right before the break, we have on the line with us UFC bantamweight women's fighter Sarah McMahon. Sarah is on the line. Sarah, how are you this morning? I'm pretty good. Well, thanks so much for joining the MMA Fight Corner. You're with Heidi Fang, Joey Varner, Phil Devine. So, guys, Heidi, let's start off with you, with Sarah, because you've been working on setting up this interview. Uh, let's begin with uh, w what your thoughts are on UFC 159 and fighting on the big stage against Sheila Gaff. Uh, I think it's really awesome. Um, women's MMA has come a long way, and people have been working, you know, for over 10 years to, you know, make something like this happen. So. It's great that uh, it's coming to fruition, and I'm excited to be on a card with such unbelievable fighters. I'm like, I'm so excited to watch the fights too. Now, the first two women's fights have set the bar pretty high coming into the UFC. What kind of impression do you hope to make in your fight against Sheila Gaff? Um, I don't know. Truthfully, I uh, I don't really think about what impression I make when I'm fighting. Um, I I go out there and. You know, my job is to position myself to do the most damage and, you know, the best ways to finish the fight. And I keep my fights set solely on that. And they just so happen to usually be pretty exciting fights because of that. And, you know, the, the crowd usually responds pretty well. But I don't make it my focus because I think that it would, I think it would take away from what I'm doing. I'd be a little bit too distracted worrying about the crowd instead of, you know, being in the moment in the fight. Well, yeah, your last fight that you had was the Invicta uh, fight against Shayna Baszler. That was pretty awesome. And you're known for being a world-class grappler, an Olympic silver medalist in wrestling, and now you're going up against the German Tank, who has six knockouts amongst her ten wins. Uh, what do you see as her biggest weakness that you're going to, or vulnerability that you'll be able to attack? I think that um, the, her greatest strength is her greatest weakness. Um, the fact that she's such a high pace and that she is, you know, constantly attacking, that leaves a lot of room for error, that leaves a lot of room, you know, for you to be uh, counterattacked. So, you know, like, whenever you have that kind of style, either you win big or you lose big, you know. So that's what I really think is going to end up, you know, working against her. It's a double-edged sword. Right. You've had an interesting 10 months uh, coming up. You know, you've been out since... You left Invicta, you signed with Strikeforce, the Strikeforce card got canceled. Uh, do you think that you'll be able to pick right back up where you left off? Oh, absolutely. Um, actually, I hope to be doing better than that because um, I've been working really hard on the, the things that I wanted to change and correct from my fight with Shayna. And then I've gone up to different places to train, too. Um, I've gone up to TriStar. I've gone to Marcelo Garcia's. Um, constantly looking to grow and to learn and become a better athlete every time I step out there. Yeah, and it's been a while since you've been in there and since you've started your career. And, and granted, it was, o it was only two years ago, and, and you've come so far so quick. But it, it's been a while since you've been in there, and you're also in the UFC for the first time. It's a much bigger cage. I mean, we had Daniel Cormier on the other day, and he's got the Olympic experience, and he said he wouldn't get the jitters and he didn't worry about the time off. Do you have uh, any questions or thoughts about going into that with such a long layoff? And this being, you know, the big UFC debut? You know, I don't really um, think about it like that. Uh, I really just focus more on my opponent and what I need to do. Uh, once I step in that cage, like really even the, the fight day, none of that stuff, I don't even see it. Like, I can't hear the crowd when I'm competing. I have, you know, honestly everything in the world could blow up outside that cage, and I would not know until the last bell. So, um that's just a kind of focus that I've gotten over, you know, so many years. And I think that it's Daniel, you know, that's the same thing with Daniel. If you're a competitor and you've done this for almost 20 years, I mean, you just don't get the jitters the same way somebody else who's been doing it for like, you know, four or five years. And this is their first big experience. We've been competing at nationals, world championships, Pan Ams, World Cups. I mean, we've had a lot of really big, really important competitions that, this is amongst them, but it's not, you know, it's not enough to throw us off our game. We've already gone through that. You know, uh, do you have a plan, though, for if, if 
you step out there? Are you, are, let me rephrase that. Are you prepared for the possibility to step out there and suddenly you get hit with the hardest case of jitters ever? And the only reason I'm asking, I'm not trying to psych you out way ahead of time, but, you know, Daniel kind of going into his fight before his debut in the UFC, he almost verbatim said the same thing as you, you know, that I've been, I've been competing my whole life at the highest level. I'm used to it. You know, I, 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 it's a competitor state of mind. I block out the crowd. I focused. But then after the fight, he said, you know, Man, he, he didn't expect it, but he had it bad. His legs weren't working. He, he felt weird. His body wasn't flowing. He, he had nerves, butterflies in his stomach. You know, He said he didn't ever think he would feel that again because he's been so prepared, trained in the art of competition, but it hit him hard and that the octagon jitters are for real. So you know, are, are you ready for the possibility of you stepping out there and suddenly you know, just you're on rubber legs and, and, and you've got you know, bubble guts? Um. I didn't feel it remotely, like, at the Olympics, and that was the pinnacle of my career. Like, I just don't feel it the same way other people do, and that's just, I don't know why that is, but I think it's part of it, like, um, I'm just naturally a thrill seeker, so really, like, the more nervous I get, it really translates, it translates into excitement for me. Like, if anything, like, I could, um... I would make a mistake in the fact that I'd be too excited and I'd get a little over anxious for something, but that's how it would display. But um, I mean, I because of the fact that I respect how big the UFC is, I've already accounted for it in my training camps. You know, like I don't usually get the jitters because every time I train for a big event, I'm saying, Sarah, there's a possibility you're going to feel like this. How are you going to deal with it? I have game plans. I have different things that I do. You know, that I already know how to train my body to account for those things. So I'm not worried about it at all because it's not that it just doesn't like happen whatsoever is I've already worked through it so many times. And you know, like each time I go out there, it's important to me to do my best and to win. So I'm not going to care more. I didn't want to lose Invicta. I didn't want to lose whenever I fought for Strike Force. Or, I mean, um, yeah, for Strike Force, but I fought for them or Pro Elite. So, and I, equally don't want to lose this so it, it's going to feel almost the same that's awesome now you know what you've been the person since they announced the women's division you've been the person i've been telling everyone to keep their eye on you know i don't want necessarily want to call you the dark horse of the division but you know i just think you've got the credentials with your wrestling and, and your your natural um progression in the striking game you know very different in in the look but very similar in the progression that daniel cormier has has made you know um that, that i've been telling everyone this is the girl to keep your eye on you know and not to look past sheila gaff gaff but i, I just want to ask you straight out do you have the skill set that's needed to beat Ronda Rousey? I believe I do. I don't think that I'd be fighting if I didn't either naturally have it or acquire it to be the best in, in the world. Like, and if she gets beat by Kat, then I'll have the skill set to beat Kat Zingano. And that's just, I think, the way that every really high-level athlete thinks about those things. Wow, I love I love it. I absolutely love it. I can't wait to hear that one day when they get to say Ronda Rousey versus Sarah McMahon. It's just going to be so much fun. And Sarah McMahon is on the line with us right now. And Sarah, really quickly, uh, we like to just throw out, we're going to change the subject up a little bit here. We're going to ask you five quick questions. Just ask the first thing that comes to your mind um, or your or the first positive true answer. Uh, <laughs> which this is a fun <laughs> segment, so just have fun with this. <laughs> Phil, Phil's crazy, so he didn't ask you crazy <laughs> questions. <laughs> Uh, who's your favorite superhero? Um, oh, man, I don't even know. <laughs> Let's see. I guess uh, Superman. Sup I grew up watching Superman. All right, okay. If you could own any car in the world, what would it be? Lamborghini. Nice. What was the last movie you saw? Um, <laughs> Tangled. <laughs> I watched movies <laughs> with my daughter. <laughs> nice. Uh, what was the m best inspirational quote you've ever heard? Arnold Schwarzenegger quote, it says, winning does not develop strength. Your struggle develops your strength. When you go through hardship and decide not to surrender, that is strength. Wow, very awesome. nice. Awesome. awesome. If it comes from Arnold, you know it's true. That is right. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, weapon of choice in a zombie apocalypse. Um, I saw this awesome thing on, like, I think it was like a movie they were creating a knife, and it had, like, this huge, like, cleaver 
and it had like all these things spiking and sticking out and it looked like brass knuckles on the handle and it cut through a pig like it was nothing that's that would be mine was i like it, the way it, she thinks was <laughs> it a, was it a zombie pig or was it just a normal pig I think it was a normal pig, but okay. I think it would wreck a zombie, too. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Nice. Well, you know, Sarah, this is uh, Dave Carney, the producer here, and I have a question for you because you've got a master's degree in mental health counseling for uh, from Gardner-Webb University. Do you think, back to Joey's question about getting around the jitters and the nerves and things like this, do you think that having that kind of a background, you know, in, in the higher mental art, so to speak, uh, you know, gives you a bit of a leg up on some of your other competitors? I think it, it definitely does. Um, I've always been interested in sports psychology, and, you know, I've had, like, a kind of toughness and a kind of uh, ability to, you know, run towards the action rather than away from it naturally. But I think that it's just like uh, lifting weights. Even if you're strong, you can always be sharper. You know, you can always try to prepare ahead of time. And uh, I think everything you can do on the front end, whether it's physically, mentally, emotionally, and everything, like, the best you can prepare yourself, you know, the better off you're going to perform. And I think that beyond the basic skills, you know, the the biggest thing that separates a lot of people from, you know, winning or losing is the six inches between their ears. So um, it's really important to me. And I know that, you know, like when I go to the fight, I experience nerves for every single fight, you know, but I need those nerves. And those are my friends. So... You know, I'm not saying I'm going to walk up there cool as a cucumber. Sure, mm-hmm. yes. I know that, <laughs> you know, I need a certain amount of nerves because this girl is going to try to knock my head off. And if I'm not, you know, if I go out there relaxed and feeling flat, I m- that might just happen. So. Well, speaking about your uh, master's degree in mel- mental health counseling, uh, do you think maybe we could set up an appointment with, with, with our very own Phil Devine and you? Because I think you need some <laughs> mental health counseling. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Sorry, sorry. I worked with deranged individuals. Uh, I, well, listen, this, this is all prepared, I think, Sarah McMahon for a great career uh, in the UFC. Again, Sarah's going to be fighting Sheila Gaff in the UFC 159 at the Prudential Center in New Jersey on April 27th. We all know this is a pay-per-view event. But if you can't afford it yourself, go out to your neighborhood bar, your Buffalo Wild Wings. They always have it on. And you can see what uh, has really become for all of us here, Sarah, one of the most interesting and exciting parts of the UFC cards now are these women fights. Uh, They've won fight of the night. Great stuff. We're very excited. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And we hope to talk to you again sometime after your victory. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks a bunch. When we come back, guys, uh, we're going to be talking about a lot of stuff. We've got Phil's This Week in MMA History, but we've still got a few minutes left in this segment. I want to touch on a couple of things that Heidi has uh, wanted to talk about this whole show. I know she's chomping at the bit, and that, of course, is some FX prelim and Facebook standouts from this weekend. And also, I want to get Joey and Phil's take on Team Alpha Male success because they completed a hat trick uh, this weekend at UFC on Fox 7, so I want to talk about that. But first, Heidi, with you and the FX prelim and Facebook standouts, why don't you break us down on that a little bit? First, I got to send out some props to Miles Jury for remaining undefeated, going in there, knocking out Ramsey Najem, and just with one punch placed perfectly, uh, basically on the button. I mean, they did the slow mo cam of it, and you just saw his whole face have a shockwave sent through it. I it was unbelievable. Love the Fox slow motion cam. Absolutely love it. And how. Perfect was it that this weekend you talked about it, Dave, earlier. There's you know nine f- uh, not or eight knockouts, eight knockouts the, on the yep. card, and every single one of them that they showed in Fox Super Slow Mo was like a treat into itself. It was, I mean, you have gifts galore for the next <laughs> month. Yeah. Oh, Yoel Romero, the flying that knee fly- the oh, open, to open the card. It was on the Facebook fight. He knocked out Clifford Starks. It was just an amazingly timed flying knee, which we don't get too much of as a knockout finish. It, w- it was really awesome to see. And then also Anthony and Jaquani, our Las Vegas hometown boy, he had a beautifully timed left hook. It was almost <coughs> just as Roger Bowling came right into it. He said he was thinking of throwing an uppercut, but at the last minute, or second rather, switched it over to a left hook. It was just amazing. And, you know, and kind of on the way down, he almost seemed to try to catch Roger Bowling. Like he was like, afraid for him to hurt himself. It was like Bowling down. ran into a wall. Right. The way he <laughs> fell. No, it was like Bowling was a pin <laughs> by a bowling ball. 
All right, well, guys, real quick, uh, Joey, Phil, you know, Chad Mendez made it a hat trick for Team Alpha Male in his win over uh, Darren Elkins uh, on Saturday night as well, too. But, you know, you guys have about a minute here. Uh, break us down real quick on what you think that means for a club like Team Alpha Male uh, going forward. You know, it's, it's, it's not just Team Alpha Male. It's Bang We Tie at Team Alpha Male. Dwayne Bang Ludwig, one of the best strikers, pure kickboxers in the history of mixed martial arts, is showing that he's developed himself into a phenomenal coach. Not only do all three of these guys win their fight, but all three of these wrestlers win by knockout. And most of the guys out of this is TJ Dillashaw's second knockout since Dwayne's been there. You know, aside from Uriah choking choking out uh, Menjavar. Menjavar and then tapping out Scotty Jorgensen as well, most of the wins have come by way of knockout for Team Alpha Male. You know, a lot of people make jokes about Team Alpha Male about their size, and you know MMA roasted jokes with them a lot. But I may say a Team Alpha Male right now may be the best team out there with the addition of Dwayne Bang Ludwig. And you have to look at them inside the UFC, inside the Octagon. They're eight and zero. Outside the Octagon, if you consider all the other promotions, I believe that they're ten and zero. And all of them have come by way of finish, no decisions. And the technical striking is just unbelievable what they've developed. Yeah, it's it's really a great club, and I think Joey hit it on the head. It's not just the club; it's what they're working with inside. When we come back on the MMA Fight Corner, we're going to be getting through this week in MMA history with Filthy Phil Divine. We've got that and much more with Joey and Heidi. Stay tuned. We'll be back. Fox Sports 920 Studio in Las Vegas and streaming worldwide on UFCRadio.com. All right, welcome back to the MMA Fight Corner. Coming at you from the Fox Sports 920 studios in Las Vegas and streaming worldwide on UFCRadio.com. Dave Carney, Heidi Fang, Joey Varner, Phil Devine. Uh, if you're just tuning in to the MMA Fight Corner, we had a great interview the guys just did with Sarah McMahon, who's a UFC bantamweight fighter. She's going to be fighting in the upcoming UFC 159 back in New Jersey. But right now, without further ado, we're going to jump right into the meat and potatoes of the end segment of our show today and that of course is this week in MMA history with Phil Devine. Yes, this week in MMA history, quite a lot has happened. It was on April 3rd, 2005, Pride Total Elimination. The opening round of Pride's 2005 Middleweight Grand Prix Tournament took place in Osaka, Japan. 16 of Pride's biggest stars converged on the Osaka Dome that night, but it was Mauricio Shogun Hua that shined the brightest. Shogun was matched up against Pride superstar Rampage Jackson and absolutely annihilated him, finishing with soccer kicks in the first round. Also that on the card that night, Vitor Belfort suffered his very first submission loss when he was tapped by a guillotine choke with Alistair Overeem. Antonio Rogerio Nogueira submitted Dan Henderson with an arm bar, becoming only the second man to defeat Hendo via submission. Kazuki Sakuraba knocked out judo champion Dung Sik Young in 38 seconds. Vandele Silva, Igor Fojansen, Nakamura and Ricardo Arona all advanced to the quarterfinal round that night with decision wins. Pride Total Elimination 2004, which was the first round of the Pride Heavyweight Grand Prix, took place one year earlier on April 25th, and it went down in Japan. It, was, it had some of the world's greatest heavyweights involved, but it also had some of the worst ones involved, too. Seven of the eight fights... As with every Pride event. Uh, exactly. <laughs> Seven of the eight fights on the card ended in the first round. Fedor Emelianenko submitted Mark Coleman in just over two minutes. 
Big Nog won using an anaconda choke against Hirotaka Yoki, becoming the first and only man to ever sweet, uh, submit the Japanese judoka. Also, Heath Herring, Sergei Karatanov, and Kevin Randleman all won by first round KOs that night. Randleman's KO over, KO over Mirko Krokop that night is still considered one of the biggest upsets in MMA history. Dude, that was so huge. When he hit him with that left hook, I think Mirko grabbed the guillotine at first, had 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 uh, a random impressed in the corner. They separate. Randleman comes in with this leaping left hook and sleeps him, and I, I, my jaw hit the floor. I think Moro Ronaldo broke the sound barrier that night the way he <laughs> screamed. Oh, my God. <laughs> it just uh, went down. April 24th, 2010. WEC 48 will go down in history as one and the only pay-per-view appearance by the company. The main event featured featherweight champion Jose Aldo defending his title for the first time against former champion Uriah Faber. In the co-main event, Benson Henderson defeated lightweight, defended his lightweight belt by submitting Cowboy Cerrone in under two minutes with a guillotine. Manny Gambirian, Shane Roller, Scott Jorgensen were all winners that night on the pay-per-view broadcast. But the fight of the night was the preliminary match on Spike TV between the Korean zombie Chan Sung Jung and Leonard Bad Boy Garcia. It was the zombie's WEC debut that night, and he may have lost a controversial decision, but he did gain millions of fans that night, earning not only the n fight of the night bonus, but it was 2010's fight of the year. Ooh, fun fact about that card also. That was also the last time Vincent Henderson has finished an opponent to date. Absolutely. It's, that's eight fights in a row now with the one this past weekend. Yeah. And now here, here's a blast from the past, Joey. UFC 42 Sudden Impact happened April 25th, 2003 in Miami, Florida. Matt Hughes in his first championship run, the first championship run, defended his welterweight title for the fourth time, de defeating Sean Shirt by unanimous decision. Pete Spratt picked up a win over Robbie Lawler. Dislocated his hip yep, with a when, kick. When Ruthless uh, couldn't continue due to the dislocated hip. Also of note that evening, David Luiza. Dwayne, Bang Ludwig, and Rich Franklin all made their UFC debuts that night. Luiza knocked out Mark Rear. Ludwig took out a judge's decision over Genki Sudo. And Franklin notched the first of his two wins over Evan Tanner. And, you know, Evan Tanner, I was thinking about this last week when we talked about UFC uh, 59. That, that UFC 59 was his last win before his sudden yeah. death. And, yeah. Well, you know, it's a sh it was definitely a shame about Evan Tanner. He will be missed. Um, and finally, on April 28, 2002, Pride 20, Armed and Dangerous, touchdown in Yokohama, Japan. The main event was a feature attraction pitting K-1 versus Pride. K-1 star Mirko Krokop in his second ever Pride appearance took on Pride icon and greatest fighter possibly ever, Vandalay Silva. The fight took place at heavyweight, and it ended in a draw. Ricardo Arona won a split decision over Dan Henderson. Rampage Jackson and Ninja Hua picked up victories that night, and it was also pride debuts of somebody known as Little Nog and the famous Japanese, well, not Japanese, but he's huge in Japan, and he's huge all over. <laughs> Bob Sapp made his their pride debuts that <laughs> night. <laughs> Bob Sapp, and he won. <laughs> he had a TKO. You dumb broke him on those. <laughs> <laughs> and then Rampage also, he won in there uh, with one of his famous uh, trademark that Rampage was, That was the very first slam yeah. Rampage did in pride. And that's it for this week in MMA history. Well, you know, that was full of fun facts. And I'm having a hard time coming up with a succinct nickname because Heidi says fun facts. And I'm thinking, wow, fun fact Phil just rolls right off your tongue. But little known fact Phil is what we've been kind of coining you here. That was fantastic. And of course, every single Monday on UFCradio.com, Phil's going to bring you more of this week in MMA history. Uh, so that was fantastic. Now, Heidi, I want to ask you a little bit because we haven't talked about everything that we wanted to get to today. But uh, Strike Force versus UFC. This is interesting to all of us, I think, because you, Joe, Joey and Phil were talking a lot about Strike Force last week as we had different guys on uh, the show with us, but now the official tally is four to four. Okay, right. so these guys are even. What are your thoughts on that? What does that say about first Strike Force, and what does that say about the progression of these guys to the UFC? Well, I think the level of talent was always there with Strike Force, but now we're just getting to see them against competitors that we wanted to see them against. For instance, with Gilbert, you, you had him in Strike Force, and you know people were talking about the level of competition that he hadn't faced the same competition that Benson Henderson has. Well, well, now he's faced Benson Henderson, so he's got his feet wet in the UFC, and we're going to see as time goes on him face more and more competitors that are at his level, so to speak, that elite level.
level. So, and with the other guys like Jordan Mann, he was very hungry coming into his UFC debut. Not to say that he wasn't against Matt Brown, but yet that is a much more tough, grizzled opponent, veteran of the octagon. Not only that, but he only had a five-week training camp between fights. That was the yeah, big thing we didn't talk about as well. Is he took it? He rebounded, you know, so fast, and, and not just a five-week training camp. You know, uh, you don't even know. Maybe only a four-week. You know, he was right. out. You, you, you just finish a fight, you take two weeks off, you go on vacation, you eat good, you, you, you party a little, you know, the body's not fully recovered. You know, how much of that also, to take nothing away from Matt Brown's performance, but how much of that played into Jordan Meehan's performance? Well, just if you take into consideration, if we're looking at that, TJ Dillashaw, okay, Jordan Meehan. And Darren Elkins were all guys that t took fights on short notice to get on this card. They all fought less, a little over a month ago. Only one of them walked away with the win, and that was TJ. And, but only one of them fought a guy who he should have beat. T but listen, Hugo Viana, I, yes, I understand, he's, but he's a good fighter. He's a tough dude. Um, but yeah, TJ should have won the fight. He's a, he's a decent fighter. He, he, hasn't a good fight. he hasn't fought anybody. No, but he did get that beautiful knockout in his uh, last fight. I know it's Ruben Duran, but it was still it was a beautiful knockout. Yeah. I, I expected a lot out of him, but I, I did pick TJ to win the uh, TJ to win the fight. But TJ was supposed to win it. He was supposed to dominate. You know, take out the striking. Hugo Viana's the kickboxer with zero wrestling out of Brazil. You know, if TJ hadn't landed in the knockout, you know, he probably would have taken him down at, at will. But you know, he was the only guy that he was the only favorite. You know. Uh, Elkins and, and, and Brown, or no, excuse me, I guess no, Mian was the favorite as well, huh? Uh, I don't know about that. Sure I, I, I don't Mian, know about Mian was a big favorite, which okay. is surprising. Mian was a big favorite over Matt Brown. I think it was minus 300. Wow. Well, that just goes to show you on the Vegas books, guys. Anybody who likes to bet, Joey, you've taken advantage of this quite often. The Vegas odd makers still aren't on par with, with MMA, and sometimes they lay those odds where you're like, you know what, this is something <coughs> I need to take. It's not that they're not on par with MMA. They're making odds that have to appeal to the average fan. We can't be really classified as the average fan because our lives, our livelihood, our income, our living revolves around us knowing every aspect of this fight. The insides, the outsides, what's going on, how was the guy's training camp, who has he fought his last five fights against, you know, what does he like to do, what does he not do well, you know, and that's not your average fan. So the odds are made for the You know what, fan. no, but to Phil's point, though, I think that he is he is a bit right that the, the bookmakers haven't caught up with the sharps yet because, as we would call this in another sports business you guys would be the sharps okay especially if you're laying money on the line so as the sport though continues to develop on a national presence and this is what i thought was so great about the ufc on fox 7 is the fact like phil you were talking about the fox slow-mo it's the element that gets to come into play with a national televised broadcast that brings this into the homes of millions of average Americans every single week. It's what put boxing really on the stage as the number one sport in the in the 50s and the 60s was it's, you know, every single Friday night you were getting new great fights. And that's what we see on the UFC at Fox. So I think you're right. And I'd actually like to put this out there. If we have any Vegas odds makers, and I know a lot of them listen to us here on Fox 920, if we have any Vegas odds makers that would like to come on the show and give us an opinion about breaking down the UFC We'd like to hear from you uh, because I think that's a very interesting topic and one that could go round and around. And if there's still a chance for me to make money as as a non-sharp, I want in on this stuff. I'd okay. be scared about that, though, because they may steal Joey away. After <laughs> he <laughs> with hey, listen, stuff. Joey, Joey's a working man, and he's always for hire, and we know that. That's okay. We can have Joey, but we've got to have him for our show. And this has really been a fantastic show, guys. We're coming up about a minute left in the program. I uh, just want to go around the horn real quick because we had Sarah on the line with us. Fantastic. Joey, first of all, with you, what are you looking forward to on UFC 159 about five seconds? I, definitely Sarah McMahon. Okay. Uh, I've been hyping her for a long time. I said she's the one that can do it. She's the one that can beat Ronda Rousey. She likes to stand and trade, which could be dangerous against Sheila Gaff, but she's got the skill set of the silver medalist in wrestling to rely on, to fall back on, you know, and I, I think she's got all the tool in the world. Beautiful. Phil, uh, in about five seconds, what are you looking forward to as far as the Jones son and fight? Uh, I don't know. This is a real tough fight to, to really actually break down because if you look at it, you look at John Jones absolutely decimating Chael Sonnen. But there's one thing we haven't seen John Jones really like, and that's being pressured. And if there's anybody that's going to pressure him, it's Chael Sonnen. Now, Chael Sonnen may only have one or two wins at light heavyweight, 
Okay, but he has a shot this weekend, however small it is. Excellent. We're going to talk a lot more about this on Wednesday as well. Heidi, real quick, in about five seconds, do you think that the women's division of the UFC will ultimately break off into its own if these fights continue the success rate that they're having right now? No, I think that they may do the special thing of about having maybe one card devoted to all women fights, but I don't see it breaking off into two divisions, no. All right, great. Well, we're going to talk about that and a whole lot more coming up this Wednesday as we come back here on UFCRadio.com. Coming at you live from the Fox 920 studios in Las Vegas for Heidi Fang, Joey Varner, and Phil Devine. I'm Dave Carney, and remember, until we hear you next time, keep fighting the good fight on the MMA Fight Corner.